for sharing. Uh, we're going to do Q&A after our next speaker, who is uh, uh, Professor Leonard Marcus from the School of Public Health. His uh, talk is entitled, You're It, Meta Leadership Applied to the Health System Transformation. And then we'll do uh, Q&A after you complete your talk. Dr. Marcus. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Boston. Welcome to Harvard. Um, I'm going to do a semester here for our, our leadership class in one hour. So that means you got to listen real, real quick. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to something called meta leadership, uh, which is a, an approach strategy of leadership that we've developed in our program here. Um, the intent is to look at leadership problems and leadership practices on a very wide canvas. Now, we're putting all of this into a, a book uh, that we're in the middle of writing. The book is called You're It. You're It. And the meaning of you is actually double. In part, it means that you individually are responsible for what happens in the surgical suite. You're responsible for what happens in your department. You're responsible for what's happening for health policy in this country. You're It. Now, we don't believe that the person with the highest a title in a group of people is necessarily the leader. Uh, the leader is the person who can get other people to follow. So the second meaning of you is plural. So part of your responsibility then as a leader is to create that plural, to, re to create that crowd who will actually follow you. Now, we're in the midst of a huge change in our healthcare system right now, and we therefore believe it's important to understand the arc of time. The arc of time. Here in Boston, we actually call it the arc of time. The arc of time. So that means you have what was, what is, and what will be. And those three time frames are very, very different. Because what was, in some way, it's familiar, it's comfortable, it's known. We know what to do with what was. What will be is predictably unpredictable. We simply don't know what Congress is going to do. We don't know what the White House is going to do. So we're in a phase right now of looking into the future, and if someone tells you here for sure is what it's going to look like, they're probably not telling you the whole truth. So we have a situation in the future that's predictably unpredictable. So what you need to be doing in the present is what we call this leap of faith. Now, how do you understand what's happening? How do you lead a group of people into the future? And in many ways, it's leaders who will drive this transition. Leaders who will understand how we go from what was to what will be. Now, I hope that this hour we're together will be very pragmatically useful for you. I'm going to ask you now to choose um, a case. We love the case method here. To choose a case that you're going to be working on for the next hour, something to which you must adapt. That's the critical responsibility of a leader. And there are three possibilities that you can think about as you put your case together. It could be something that you adapt to personally. You might have, for example, a new job. You might have a new boss. You might have a new staff. So that would be personal adaptation. And adaptation is in part about how you will change. That's my personal change. And then as a leader, how you will encourage change among other people. Your adaptation could be organizational within your institution. So what needs to change in your institution? How will you encourage that change? And then how will you have to change yourself to be a part of that change? Or it could be on the systems level. Uh, what new policies do you need to adapt to? What new reimbursement approaches do you need to adapt to? How do you adapt your organization to these changes? How do you adapt what you're doing as a society to these changes? So develop your case to which you're going to be thinking about for the next hour. What it is that you need to be adapting to as a leader. Now, adaptation would be really easy if you were simply to get up and say, this is what we need to do, and everyone would do it. Today, we're dealing in a world that is increasingly complex. 
And complexity in healthcare leadership means that there are a lot of other stakeholders up, out there. Um, these could include insurers, these could include Congress, these could include other healthcare organizations in your marketplace. There's a lot of complexity out there. There are a lot of different stakeholders that have an interest in whatever is your case, what it is that you're adapting to. So as you consider this whole question of adaptation, who are those stakeholders? What are the differences of interest between all of those other people and you? So if you were to say, here are my interests in this particular case, who are all the other stakeholders? What are their interests? Who will help you along? And who will be your obstacle? So as a leader, you have to recognize that you're dealing in a very complex environment. And how will you then adapt to that complex environment? Now, every book on leadership um, has to define what leadership is. And usually, uh, definitions have many, many words about visions and objectives. Our definition for leadership is very simple. It's people follow you. People follow you. Now, you, you're OK. Uh, what makes this, of course, very difficult uh, is the people side of it. So who are the people that you need to engage? Um, what will get them to be part of what you're doing? And we're not particularly caught up in the order of the words in our definition. Sometimes it's not people follow you. Sometimes it's you follow people. So as a leader, it's not simply putting out guidelines, putting out your ambitions. It's understanding how what you're doing, here's adaptation, it's understanding what you're doing and how it fits with, with what's going on in your environment. So sometimes it's you follow people. And the best way to get people to follow you is to see that as a very dynamic process. So, meta-leadership. Where did this come from, and uh, what does it mean? Now, um, I have two uh, very interesting hats. One of them is in healthcare. I uh, direct the program for healthcare negotiation and conflict resolution here at the School of Public Health, teach classes on leadership. Shortly after 9-11, uh, the CDC came up to Harvard and asked us um, to study crisis leadership. Um, this was David Gergen, who's over at the Kennedy School of Government, and myself, and basically said after 9-11, would Harvard invest its resources into studying leaders, into teaching leaders, and into analyzing leaders in the whole Homeland Security, Department of Defense, intelligence arena? And of course, after 9-11, no one could say no. And the commitment that we made is that we would be with leaders in times of crisis. So I was with Mike Brown, uh, embedded with Mike Brown during Hurricane Katrina, so was able to understand and observe that. We've worked with the Secret Service, TSA, CDC, FEMA, et cetera. So what I'm sharing with you then is the collection of what we've learned about healthcare and healthcare leadership, and what we've learned about homeland security and preparedness leadership. So where did this term meta-leadership come from? One of the people that I was following early on, a fellow by the name of Joe Henderson. Joe, at the time, was at the CDC, and he was the director of the Office for Terrorism Preparedness and Emergency Response. This is back in 2003. And Joe and I decided, and we agreed, that I would follow him in his leadership um, of this very important arena at the CDC. We spoke sometimes two and three times a day. So December 2003, I know he's just about to go on vacation with his family. He calls me up. He says, did you hear that Ridge just called an orange alert? This is Secretary Tom Ridge, Department of Homeland Security. And back then, we had a color-coded alert system. And I said, yes, I did. He said, I'm going up to Washington. I said, Joe, what do you need to be in Washington for? You've got a secure cable. You can be in touch with Washington from your home in Atlanta. And he said, and I quote, public health needs to be in the room. So Joe goes up to Washington, and he walks into the room where they're sifting through all of that intelligence. At the time, they were looking at some pretty scary stuff. Possibility of more anthrax attacks, remember right after 9-11? Uh, people believe that Saddam Hussein had um, smallpox, release of smallpox into the population. A tularemia, botulinum, possibility of a dirty bomb, which is nuclear material packed around a conventional bomb, and even that the bad guys 
had a small suitcase bomb, a nuclear weapon, that they could detonate in an American city. So Joe goes into the room, and like most of us, the first time you go to a new committee meeting, try and figure out who's in charge, what's the strategy, what's going on. He said after a day, it was really clear nobody was in charge. There wasn't really a strategy. Everybody was in panic mode. So Joe goes back to the Washington side of that secure cable, puts together six different working groups back in Atlanta, and gives each working group an assignment. There's the anthrax group, the smallpox group, et cetera. And he gives them a big spreadsheet. And at the top of the spreadsheet, it would be, if this were to happen, if this attack were to happen, how many fatalities would there be? How many injuries? Uh, what would be the impact of the critical infrastructure? What should the federal government do? What should the president do, et cetera? Whole series of questions at the top. And then time frames, zero hours, what it would look like in the moment of the attack. What would it look like one hour, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, and then increments all the way out to 30 days. He gave each group 48 hours to complete the task. After 48 hours, he, Joe collects those reports in Washington, and he walks into the room where they're sifting through that intelligence. Now, don't forget Joe is in a second-tier agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, and Joe is a second-tier leader within that department. So he goes in and presents his report to a Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services, White House Homeland Security Council, et cetera. They heard what Joe recommended, they heard his framework, and they accepted it. And the person from the White House Homeland Security Council took Joe's report back to the White House, briefed the National Security Council, they put Joe's report into a much uh, briefer report and used it to brief the President of the United States. Three weeks later, I went down to, to Atlanta to debrief Joe about his leadership experience. When he was done telling me the story, I said, Joe, that wasn't leadership, and I was searching for the right word. Now, the word that came to mind is meta-research. And of course, what we know, a meta-researcher will look at a number of different studies, each of which are considering different variables or different factors, and the meta-researcher will ask, what are the cross-cutting themes or what are the practice implications of this body of research? So that term went through my mind. I said, Joe, that wasn't leadership. That was meta-leadership. And so we had that word. We didn't know what exactly it meant. We didn't know how to do it. And we didn't know how to teach it. So we invited Joe uh, up to our office in Cambridge. In our conference room, we've got a whiteboard. So there are a group of us sitting around this whiteboard trying to figure out what does this meta-leadership mean and then how do you practice and teach it? So somebody went up there and drew a circle in the middle of the board and said it starts with you. It's the person of the meta-leader. You are a role model for other people who look to you as a leader. Your emotional intelligence, your ability to get out of that panic mode is critical for other people who would follow you. That made sense. Then somebody else went up to the board and drew a larger circle around that middle one and said, and you as a leader are in a situation. You didn't necessarily create the situation. It's not your fault. However, your job as a leader is to figure out what happened and what do we need to do about it. That made sense. And then we started thinking about the people. And as a leader, what you need to do is to be a convener, to create a convening narrative that would bring the right people around the table, what we call connectivity. That means, in part, you're leading down to those people who are your subordinates, and you're also leading up, not managing up, leading up to your boss or to people who are higher rank hierarchically. And then finally, considering all the other organizations and all the other departments, that are part of your enterprise, you're also leading across to those departments and you're leading beyond to organizations outside of your chain of command. Now when you think about it, this is exactly what Joe did in that orange alert. Person of the meta leader, public health needs to be in the room. Understood the situation and put it into components that people could understand and then use as actionable items. Led down to his group in Atlanta, led up ultimately to the President of the United States, and led across to build connectivity of effort among all the different agencies and organizations that were part of that response. So we started teaching meta-leadership about 13 years ago. 
And now we go out into the field when events happen, when crises happen. We engage people in complex problem solving. And what we've learned in observing people using meta-leadership in the field is that if people go into a complex problem with the question, how can I make you a success? How can I make you a success? It completely changes the equation. So leading down your subordinates, leading up, we all have a boss, uh, and leading across, how do we understand the enterprise of what it is that we're doing, and how can we work together to advance the purposes of creating a success? So what I'm gonna do is quickly review the highlights of each of these dimensions of meta-leadership, starting with the person of the meta-leader. In part, how do you define yourself as a leader? Now go back to your case about which you adapt, which you're trying to come up with a strategy for adaptation. What's your role in this particular case? Many times leaders will say, I have a responsibility to be present. There is a problem here. There is an opportunity. I want to place myself as a problem solver in whatever is the conundrum requiring adaptation. The other question is, how does the healthcare system or how does your organization define you as a leader? We find that the most effective meta leaders are able to wield influence well beyond their authority. Influence beyond their authority. Your organization gives you a measure of authority. If you think about some of the great leaders you've known or worked with, the meta leaders, looking at problems very widely, they're often able to get people to do things, not because they order them to do it, it's rather you're inspired by these people, you believe in these people, and you want to follow those people. So you'll probably be more successful in advancing your case if you're able to wield influence beyond authority. Now, as we've been studying leaders in healthcare and in crisis situations, we've been fascinated by learned behaviors. We believe you can learn to be a better behavior. People often ask, are you born a leader or can you acquire these skills? And we're of the mindset that there are many different types of leaders and leadership is something that you can certainly learn. What we're also fascinated with, and we're just coming out with a paper on this, is how our brain is wired and how instinctual behaviors also affect us as leaders. And if we think about the people who would follow us, how do we understand those instinctual behaviors and how do we make them part of our strategy of leadership? Now, looking very quickly um, at the brain, um, there are three important parts of the brain that are relevant to this whole question of meta-leadership. One, what we call, what's oftentimes called the reptilian brain, we call the basement. And that's where those primitive survival patterns um, in our mind uh, reside. In the middle of our brain, what we call the toolbox. Those are all those things that you learn to do and do them in a sense almost automatically. Sometimes in the morning, you get in your car the next thing you know, you're at work. You're not quite sure exactly what happened in between. So your surgical skills, your um, uh, procedural skills, those are all learned behavior that are in your toolbox. And finally, at the very highest level of our brain, what we call the laboratory, our neocortex. Uh, this is where we learn new things, this is where we learn adaptation, and this is where we're able to engage in complex problem solving. Now we all know that right in the middle of our brain is the amygdala, and the amygdala is our sentry. It's always checking if things are safe, and if there's any danger, what our amygdala would do is ignite. So if all of a sudden a large boulder came crashing into this room, our amygdala would ignite and take us to the basement. Now you might feel, for this moment, that your heart is going just a little bit faster, you're breathing just a little bit deeper, you had an amygdala hijack, you are now in the basement. Now, don't forget, this is part of our survival mechanism, and uh, it's what helped your ancestors 
when a saber-toothed tiger came walking down the pathway uh, to run faster than the other guy who doesn't have any progeny in the room. <laughs> so we will automatically go to the basement as part of our survival instinct. And when we're in the basement, the only three activities we can engage in are freeze, flight, and fight. Now think of it in terms of a rabbit. A rabbit is out in the wild, prey comes along. The first thing the rabbit does is freeze to try and camouflage into its surroundings. If the prey gets closer, the rabbit will run. It'll flight, try to get away from the prey. And if the prey gets really, really close, the rabbit will fight. We have exactly those same instincts in our brain. Um, how many people here have kids? OK, well, kids were designed to send you to the basement, right? Uh, we have a 17-year-old, David, and uh, it's 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. Uh, David's curfew is at, 11, uh, uh, at 1030. Um, we didn't get a telephone call from him. Uh, we call him. David doesn't answer his phone. Where are Wendy and me? We are in the basement, right? You're about to go on a trip. You open your wallet. Your significant other did a loan program. There's no money in it. You are in the basement. Uh, you lose your keys. Uh, your boss writes you an angry email. You are in the basement. So there are a lot of things that can send you down into the basement. The question is, how do you get yourself or how do you get other people up and out of the basement? There it's important for you to get into that toolbox. Getting into the toolbox is a lot like resetting your brain. Just like you have to sometimes turn off your computer and reset it to get it going, it's critical then to go to the policies, procedures, activities, or even prompts, what we call your trigger script, to get your brain back oriented and disciplined. Now, among the people that we studied uh, were the leaders in the response to the Boston Marathon bombings here in Boston. Uh, many of them had been through this training, so they knew all about the basement. One of, the, uh, one of those interviews was with the um, uh, Boston, uh, current uh, Boston uh, Police Commissioner, Billy Evans, who was in our class when the, uh, when the uh, marathon bombings occurred. Billy was the incident commander for the arrest of the younger brother who had gotten free and was on the loose in Watertown. So Billy said, there he is. The kid is in the boat in front of him. He walks up. Something sharp is coming out of the boat. Um, he didn't know if it was his fingers or if it was a gun. So he said, I pulled back. I'm at the end of the driveway. Boat's in front of me. He said, I've got a state cop on one side, Watertown cop on the other. And he said, I've got 150 people standing right behind me, all with guns pointed at my back. I said, well, Billy, what did you do? He said, well, I went to the basement. So we asked him and many others, what did you do to get yourself out of the basement? And what they said is what went through their mind was the phrase, was the phrase I can do this. Uh, I've got the training. I've got the skills. I can do this. And knowing the other people that were part of their team, it was, we can do this. And what he and many others said is once those phrases went into their mindset, they had the confidence to be able to lead through that event with all of the unknowns. And so my suggestion to you is to recognize when you go to the basement, when other people go to the basement, and then have those prompts or that trigger strip ready to help you get out of the basement. Um, I do a lot of traveling, go through a lot of airports. There are a lot of reasons to go to the basement in an airport. And my trigger script is always don't say anything until you're calmed down, right? Because you're only going to make a bad situation much worse. So what's your trigger script when you go to the basement? And there are a lot of things that can send us down to the basement. If you want to do a little bit of a fascinating exercise for a day, just record how many times you go to the basement. It could be the car in front of you is stopping, and you have to put on your brakes. Even worse, the car behind you has got lights going. All those things can send you to the basement. So, from there, what you need to do strategically as a meta leader is then once you've got other people out of the basement, you can go to that higher level thinking. My colleague, Barry Dorn, who's worked with us on putting this together, was the uh, physician on call at Fort Dix uh, in the last days of the Vietnam War. 
and he was having a very quiet Sunday when somebody dropped a bomb in the ordnance shack and exploded and exploded other bombs. Barry gets the call. There are 20 plus people with life-threatening injuries coming to this small clinic on base. He said, I went to the basement. And then as he was about to receive those patients, he went into that toolbox, said, I've seen everything that's about to come in, and my objective is that no one loses their life. Now, when the nurses and the other people at the clinic heard about this, they also went to the basement. So what Barry did is he pulled everybody together and then said, you, uh, turn the ICU into a surgical suite. You, check with other hospitals in the area to bring blood in. He gave everybody a job. That got them out of the basement. And then with that, Barry was able to go to that higher level of thinking and say, what's the situation that we've got? What is it that we need in this situation? And then strategically, how do we close those gaps? So we call this working with your brain. First, you need to admit that you're in the basement. And I have a prompt that just tells me, Lenny, you're in the basement. Okay? Second, you've got to get into that toolbox. Whatever it takes you to get your mind disciplined again. And finally, then you've got to get into that higher level of thinking to close the gaps. We call this working with your brain. The reason I included this piece today is periodically hospitals will ask me to come in and help them with problem solving. And I was asked to go out to a hospital in the Midwest, mid-sized town. Uh, the medical center was expanding, so they were bringing in a whole group of new surgeons. And there were a group of surgeons who had been there for many years. And as it turned out, the new surgeons and the surgeons who had been there uh, prior uh, had a real rivalry going. And one of the community surgeons was in the middle of surgery and things weren't going well. It was a pediatric uh, patient. Um, and the problem that he was having was the specialty of his rival. And as a number of people told me, um, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And people said, well, why don't we bring in Dr. A? And he said, damn it, we're not bringing him in. So he was in the basement. And he was going deeper and deeper into the basement. And the more they encouraged him to bring in Dr. A, the deeper into the basement he got until the patient died. So the emotions that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and the emotions of other people in the room are critical to your work um, at the surgical table and critical to your work in policy and organizational leadership. Now, you can forget everything I talked about for this hour. If you only remember this one slide, your hour will have been worth it. Never. Lead, negotiate, make major life decisions, or send an email when you are in the basement. OK? We've all done it. OK, we've all done it. Uh, remember, the speech or the decision that you make uh, in the basement is the one you are most likely to regret. The problem is not going to the basement. You will go to the basement automatically. It's part of your survival instinct. The problem is how deep into the basement you go, how long you stay there, and what you do while you're there. And now, here's my recommendation to you. First, teach this little um, lesson to your family. So Wendy, David, and I were recently on a bike trip, um, uh, the three of us. Wendy had a pretty bad bike accident. She's doing fine, very recently. And uh, David and I had to respond to what was going on. We got her to the hospital. It all worked out. But what was really moving for me afterwards is that David said, Dad, I went to the basement. Um, you know, I, I, got, you know, I was calling the ambulance. He was taking care of Wendy. You know, I put my, my legs on either side of Mom's head, checked that she could move her fingers, move her toes. You know, I was really, really going through every piece of the checklist just to make sure she was OK once I realized that. She was OK. I was in my toolbox, and I was just taking care of her. So this is an, an important lesson for young people. Uh, it's an important lesson for other members of your family. I will admit, both David and Wendy can say to me, Dad, you're in the basement. It's, it's, it's a non-adversarial, friendly thing to say. And the other thing is I encourage you to teach this to your colleagues when you get back. It's real easy. Just draw a picture of the brain, two lines. You know, in the middle, what sends you down to the basement, what it takes you to get out of the basement, and then what it means for you to get in that higher level strategic thinking. We've taught this to many, many different hospitals and healthcare systems. We've taught this to the National Counterterrorism Center and the DOD and FEMA and the CDC. 
and especially if you're in a situation where there's a crisis or a major problem that takes people to the basement, having this vocabulary on board early on and beforehand can be really important. So that was the person of the meta leader. Next, the situation. And the situation requires you to figure out what's happening and what ought to be done about it. So here's a very simple tool that um, we've devised that can help you as a prompt uh, when you're dealing with a complex situation. Now, what you see here is a shape inside a cube. Uh, for you, the cube is transparent. Two groups are given the assignment to figure out what's inside. For them, the cube is opaque. One group gets to look through peephole A. The other group gets to look through peephole B. What are the people seeing who are looking through peephole A? Triangle. And the people who are looking through peephole B? Circle. I know what you're thinking. Wow, Harvard must have spent years figuring that one out. <laughs> so, so what inspired this for us is it's right after 9-11. We're trying to help leaders understand what happened and how not to do it again. And so this is what we, uh, what we did to try and work through and debrief the, the experience at the World Trade Center. So you might remember that um, the fire department set up a command center at the bottom of the World Trade Center. So they had a vertical view of what's going on. And what firefighters do is they keep sending people into the building when they see a fire up there. The New York Police Department, however, had a helicopter that was flying around the buildings. They could see where the jet fuel hit. It exploded. The girders holding up the building were red hot and about to melt. And when the top of the building hit the mid section, the whole building would collapse. Now, there had been a history of conflict between New York police and New York fire. So when they went out to get radios, they were not interoperable. So the New York Police Department ordered an evacuation of the building while the New York Fire Department was sending people in. And so that day, 23 New York police died, 343 fire. Lack of connectivity. So we've been teaching this notion of the cone in the cube ever since. And what simply means is that when you're dealing with a complex problem, there'll be different people who look at the problem from a different perspective. And so your job as a meta leader is to integrate those different perspectives and to figure out what's going on. Example, H1N1, 2009, the CDC stood up their emergency operations center on Thursday evening, uh, April 2009. I got a call at 2.03 on Saturday, come on down. I'm on the 4.30 flight down to Atlanta and get down uh, to Atlanta, pick up my car, call up, this is Saturday night now, the lead policy doc at the White House, Carter Metcher. Carter had been through this seminar. Um, so they're having to figure out what they're going to say Sunday at noon from the White House policy advisory on H1N1 for the country. And I said, Carter, what do you see? And he said, and I quote, I see a cone in the queue. Some people see H1N1, it was called swine flu at the time, as a killer virus about to invade this country. Hundreds of thousands of children are about to die. And he said, and other people see this as seasonal flu. What we need to figure out overnight is what is it, how do we understand it, and then how do we put out a policy advisor that accounts for those different factors. So when you're, as a meta leader, trying to help people understand complex situations, now go back to the case to which you're trying to figure out how can we adapt. When you're trying to figure out these complex situations, you actually have a, a, a cube with more than one or two holes. Many times they're 10. The fact that they're different people who are looking at the problem from different perspectives is not a bad thing. It actually could be a plus. And you want to engage those people and you want to recruit those people to solving the problem together. That's you're at you personally, creating a you're at group who are together trying to solve that problem. Now, how do you do it? So we have studied a number of different loops. There are a lot of leadership loops, and uh, we've put together what we call the meta leadership group, a loop uh, called the pop doc loop. I'm not gonna walk you through the pop doc loop. And again, think about it in terms of the case to which you must adapt. So in your case, there are facts, there are figures, there are people, there are obstacles, there are policy. Your job is to perceive what's going on. 
So you want to collect that data. You also want to know about the people that are involved, the issues that are involved. How much can you learn about the situation? Now, having figured all of that out, what you next want to do is to try and identify what are the patterns. Now, patterns are important because that's how we, our brains, analyze information. We look for patterns. It's how we store information in our brain. It's how we recollect information. So what you're looking for in your case are patterns that help you discern what's going on. And there might be different groups or different people who you can see there are different patterns in there. Now, if you've correctly identified all of those patterns, you can predict what's going to happen next. In other words, you saw me walking, and as long as nothing changed, you could predict what's going to happen next. That's important because as a leader, you need to understand what are the trends. You need to understand what are the factors moving things forward. We call that the pop loop. That's your analysis loop, trying to figure out what's going on. Now, if all of your predictions were 100% accurate, they never are, but if they were or close to accurate, then the next thing you have to do is to make decisions. And the better your perceptions, the better your understanding of those patterns and the better your predictions of those trends and how they're playing themselves out, the better will be your decisions. And then you've got to get your organization and other people to actually operationalize those decisions. And then throughout the process, you're communicating out, here's what we're doing, and you're communicating in, trying to understand how well it's going. Now, if you made these decisions and took these actions, and they're having exactly the effect that you had hoped for, then you pull that information in, and you continue doing what you started to do. If it didn't have, as you're thinking about your case, it didn't have the expected results, then Bring that information in, perceive that information, try and understand what the patterns are now that you've started, how you're trying to change those patterns. And so basically, what you're doing is first understanding, person of the metal leader, getting out of the basement, understanding the situation, operationalizing, leading down, up, and across. The pop side of this loop is your thinking step. It's your analysis of what's going on. The doc side, in your case, are the action steps. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're moving forward to create the intended changes. And what the pop doc is for you, then, is a process of systematic trial and error. Let's go back to H1N1. Noon on that Sunday, Rich Besser, acting director of the CDC, and someone who had been through our Meta Leadership program and was practicing Meta Leadership in that we actually assign our students, and I would highly recommend, I didn't, we're not going to take time to see it today. Uh, if you type into YouTube, Richard Besser, H1N1 White House, it's really interesting to observe how he addresses the nation in that first policy advisory from the White House. And what he basically said is, this is what we know and what we're doing about it. And they had very little data at the time. And then he said, and this is what we don't know and what we're learning doing to learn more. This is what you should do, the public. Don't go out if you're sick. Don't get in an airplane if you're sick. Gave a set of instructions. Very importantly, what he said is that we're continuously collecting data and information. And as we get new data, we're going to change our advisory. And so on almost a daily basis, as new data was coming in, they were changing their advisories. Remember, at first, in the beginning, it was every, every school that had a case, the school was closed for two weeks. And then as they learned more about what this virus was all about, they were changing those advisories. Three weeks in, one of our colleagues, Bob Blendon, here at the School of Public Health, did a public opinion poll. How well do you think the government is doing in handling H1N1? 83% approval rate, which was a remarkable accomplishment for public health and health care in a very, very scary situation for this country. And part of it was because Rich was very clear about what they knew, what they didn't know, and they were constantly changing their advisories. Uh, and they were very clear with the public about what they knew and didn't know. Take this back to your case. There are a lot of unknowns um, as we're looking forward um, to how our healthcare system is going to change. Um, and how do you then, in your case, apply the pop doc uh, to that scenario? Now, 
in leading down, um, uh, this, by the way, is my um, doctoral dissertation at, at Brandeis many years ago. So um, in leading down, uh, a number of years ago, I studied uh, a brand new organization. And what I found is the second tier people uh, in those organizations were having incredible conflict uh, to the point where if one person made a policy recommendation, the other was automatically against it. And what we found is that conflict then went to their direct reports. And when we studied the people working out in the field, they were having exactly the same conflict. We call this the shadow effect of conflict. Or in other words, if a, there's a conflict at the higher tier of your hospital or higher tier of your department between leaders, that conflict, like a long shadow, will go all the way out to the front line. So here, that conflict, we could understand the people and, and, and the situations that were involved. For, for the folks that were working at the front line, they didn't understand exactly what the conflict was about. It seemed to be about procedures and was creating impediments to the getting their work done. Now, the flip side of that was if you have collaboration among leaders at the higher levels of the organization, you'll find that same collaboration, like a long shadow, plays itself out all the way to the front lines. And here's an example, because I know many of you flew here. Um, what's an example of an airline where there is a sense of collaboration at the highest level of the organization, and you can feel it with the flight attendants and the gate agents? OK. At Southwest, I've talked uh, with their leadership. Part of their performance uh, evaluation is how much fun they create for their subordinates. So one of the senior managers said, I'm really, really busy, but I had to take all of my people out for a barbecue, because if I didn't give them fun, I'd get dinged at the end of the year. What about um, an airline where there's conflict at the top and you feel it at the front lines? United? OK. So <laughs> be nice to them. <laughs> Always be friendly. Never go to the basement on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> so the point of this, you know, we could see that in our experience with these two companies, or, and sure others as well. How does it play itself in your case, or how does it play itself out in your organization? So, in part, you're leading down. In part, you're leading up. And in many ways, what meta leadership is, people follow you, and sometimes as a leader, you're trying to create a movement, and you follow people. What could that? look like. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So you it's not about one. the leader anymore. Oh, it's about you've them, seen this. plural. Okay. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. What was the lesson that you got of it the last time you saw it? Followership. OK, so people follow you. You follow people. And part of the meta leadership is being able to build teams of people who are able to do that together. Now, when we started working with the federal government after 9-11, went down to Washington, what people said to us is, what we, need help, what we need your help to do is to break down all of the silos. And the problem is that silos are working against one another. We've got to break down those silos. Now, I've lived in Boston for many years. I actually grew up in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, rural state, Midwest, um, we think silos are good things. You grow your corn and hops in silos. Good things happen in silos. The problem is not that you have different silos or different departments in your organization. The problem is that the silos are not connected. So if you've got meta leadership leading down and leading up, your strategic level is linked to your front level, your tactical level. And if you've got it across, the different departments of your organization or system are working together. And when we talk about integrated healthcare services, we're talking about bundled services, we're talking about new kinds of business relationships, being able, as you as a meta leader, to build that kind of connectivity of effort is critical and very well might be key to the case that you're thinking about in your adaptation. So building that connectivity is part of the meta that
big, wider view of leadership that we're talking about. So why? Why would you want to build that kind of table? Part of your job is integrating information and integrating know-how to build solutions, recognizing that the whole arc of time is changing rapidly. And so what you as a meta leader then can do is help adapt flexibly. And being able to be flexibly to get you and others out of the basement, that's the year it component. I'm going to in just very, very last few minutes is to share with you one of the case studies that we did about the Boston Marathon bombings uh, here back in 2013. We studied the 102 hours and what leaders were doing from the moment the bombs uh, uh, exploded on Boylston Street at the uh, very close to the marathon finish line to the point where um, the younger brother was arrested and the event ended. Um, now, one of the fascinating observation and discoveries is that there were a lot of people involved in leadership. And the, these are many, we studied and interviewed all of those leaders, um, including the governor and the mayor and the leaders of the state police, some of whom were graduates of our um, crisis leadership program. And what was fascinating is that as we were going through these interviews, at one point we realized, unlike any other crisis we'd ever studied, that no one leader was in charge of the overall event, and yet they did an extraordinary job. When we studied the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill down in the Gulf, it was the Coast Guard Commandant was in charge. FEMA was in charge during hurricanes. The CDC was in charge during H1N1 and Ebola. But nobody was in charge during the Boston Marathon bombings, and yet the results were so extraordinary. There were three people instantly killed, 264 people were injured, some and many with life-threatening uh, injuries. Every one of those 264 people survived. And they survived because there were decisions made beforehand to put tourniquets on. It was a bit controversial. Now that's been translated into a national program called Stop the Bleed. Uh, to put tourniquets on, to quickly evacuate the street in case there was a secondary bomb. Um, there was a system in place to perfectly distribute um, uh, people who, with life-threatening injuries uh, to the trauma centers in central Boston, and first to send those people, not the walking wounded, they were kept behind. Um, the hospitals, uh, uh, we did a focus group with leaders of the hospitals. They told us that people were coming in so quickly that their electronic medical record couldn't keep up, so they started using combat procedures to identify patients and to move them through the system very, very quickly. So there was extraordinary leadership in the moment, and yet nobody was in charge of the overall event. We were fascinated. So as we're going through our notes and trying to figure all of this out, my colleague Eric McNulty walked into my office and said, swarm intelligence. Eric loves bees and birds, and he can just you know, be out at the ocean and watch the birds flying around and the patterns and how they move perfectly, and when there's uh, sustenance, they all move towards the food. When there's danger, they all move away. So he's fascinated with swarm intelligence. So once he put that into the table, we started to try and figure out what is swarm intelligence and could it help us explain what the leaders did together in the response to the Boston Marathon bombing. And so there is someone here at Harvard, E.O. Wilson, who wrote, if you look, who studied ants his whole life, if you look at all the species that ever lived on planet Earth, the most successful were ants, termites, bees, and people. Why? Because they're the greatest cooperators. So what I'm going to do now is um, share with you what we understood as the principles that guided these leaders in the response to the Boston Marathon bombings. And here's what I encourage you to think as I'm sharing these principles with you. How might these principles apply to the case of adaptation that you're thinking about? So in our interviews, we went through, called what were the first things that people said, and then we put them in the order that these issues came up across all of those interviews. The first thing, the first principle of, of swarm leadership is unity of mission, where everybody toward a common narrative is trying to achieve the same thing. In Boston, it was save lives. And we interviewed a lot of people, including the uh, paramedics who ran onto the street 
they all believed that there was going to be another bomb. Don't forget, four planes on 9-11, four bombs in Madrid, four bombs in London, two bombs had gone off. They all believed that there was going to be a bomb on Boylston Street, and yet they ran out into the street. And we asked them why, and they said it was all about save lives. The second principle of swarm leadership that we discovered was generosity of spirit and action. And one of the interesting examples was there was a, a manhunt in Watertown on the Friday of that week looking for that younger brother. And when we interviewed the chief of the Boston police, Danny Linsky, I said at the end of the interview, Danny, what was your biggest regret? He said, you know, all of us leaders were at the Home Depot uh, parking lot in Watertown, and we were leading the event, and the Lions and the Kiwanis came. We had all the food and the water and the bathroom facilities that we needed. And then at the end of the day, I realized we had sent out thousands of guys in tactical gear into the neighborhoods to do house-to-house -house uh, searches, You're going door-to-door -to, -door to try and find this guy. We gave them no food, no water, no bathroom facilities. Can you imagine? So we investigated that. Turns out these guys had all the food, water, and bathroom facilities they needed. They walked into somebody's house to do a search and said, hey, guys, can we make you sandwiches? Here, take some water. You want to use our bathroom? Nobody asked the community to do that. And yet everybody jumped in and was on board. The third principle of swarm leadership was everybody in the response stayed in their own lanes until others succeed in theirs. So there wasn't this, sometimes you see this mission creep where everybody's trying to do everything. No, everybody, how can I help you succeed? Here's what we're doing. We're doing that job. Boston EMS was taking care of injured people. Boston police was cordoning off the scene, beginning the investigation. Everybody did their job with the notion, how can I help you succeed? Again, think of this applied to your case. The fourth principle, critically important, no ego, no blame. Nobody said, we did it. Nobody pointed fingers of blame at others. Imagine if this were true in your institution. No ego, no blame. And the fourth was a foundation of trusting relationships. So we came up with these five principles of swarm leadership, and then we went back to these leaders, called up the uh, FBI uh, guy in charge, um, Rick Deloria. He's a special agent in charge of the FBI. I said, Rick, this is what we came up with. And he said, Lenny, I didn't know we were doing that. It describes exactly what we were doing. So to what extent? as you're looking at these complex health problems, as you're looking at issues within your organization, how might you engage these swarm instincts which do exist for us, not only in times of crisis, our relationships in our family, sometimes our swarm life, or our participation in a house of worship, sometimes is swarm life. I'm gonna very quickly show you uh, a quick video. Um, uh, this is about fire, about fire ants. Uh, who can't swim in water, and they're put into a watery situation. So here they're facing a problem. What do they do? As you're watching this video, think about your case to which you're adapting, and how might you build that unity of effort among the people who you're leading? We found that the ants connect to themselves very, very, very well, more than we had thought. Um, and you can imagine you have 100 ants, which means 600 legs. 99% of those legs will be connected to a neighbor. So they're very, very good at making, maintaining this network. We thought they would be like grains of rice. So when you put grains of rice in a jar, they sort of just all stack and it's, it's, and it's, it's quite random. But the ants actually form almost a quite regular network. Um, grains of rice will stack on, them, stack on themselves in parallel, but ants form T-junctions. They're really forming these very strong um, junctions in order to support the structure of the raft. Ants are opaque, you can't see through them. Um, just like the bones in your body, the only way you can figure out what's going on, you've got to basically go through a CT scanner. And so that's what we put the ants through. We can see basically where every single ant, just like where every bone in your body is oriented and how they're placed next to each other. Now, I don't want to imply that the people in your department are like ants. However, there's a lot we're finding that we can learn from these instincts that are in us all um, uh, and apply it to leadership. Uh, we've taught this to the Secret Service, uh, to the presidential detail and vice presidential detail, because they're a very small operation, and yet if you've ever watched a presidential motorcade going through a town, a lot of other agencies are on board. Uh, we taught it to TSA in terms of solving, remember that weight line crisis that we had back in the spring of 2016? 
uh, just was down at the CDC teaching it to the CDC, and many different healthcare organizations and physician groups. How do we bring in that sense of teaming and that sense of unity of mission into the work that we do? So that unity of mission is about creating a central convening narrative. It could be about quality of care. It could be about patient safety. It could be about leading the profession into a whole new era of healthcare. How do you as a meta leader create that, that convening narrative? Remember that in terms of generosity of spirit, if people feel that they're part of something that's important and part of something that's valuable and worthwhile, they'll want to make those sorts of contributions. Um, making sure that everybody has a job and that everybody rec as, as recognized for the contributions that they're making. No ego, no blame sometimes can be a principle just by itself um, as uh, for leaders or for a department or for an organization working together. And finally, that foundation of trusting relationships. What you get, and again, we've been observing this a great deal uh, in the field, is order beyond control. Um, we've been teaching this to a number of different organizations, taught it to FEMA. So went down during Hurricane, uh, during Hurricane Harvey, and the federal coordinating officer down there is a graduate of our program, uh, Kevin Hannes, and he said, Lenny, I want to give you an example of swarm leadership. He said there were numerous neighborhoods that were suddenly flooded. We didn't have enough of anything to save all those people who are underwater, sometimes five feet of water. So he said, and then who should arrive? The Cajun Navy. He said, the Cajun Navy has no admirals, there's no chain of command, just a bunch of guys with boats who wanted to help out. So I put one principle of swarm leadership out there, and that was, you can please go and rescue people, just don't bring them to a place where we can't take them to safety. So don't take them from their home and put them on a bridge and now they're on an island. You know, bring them to a place where somebody can take them and we'll get them into a shelter. One rule that would be a principle for that whole swarm, and they were truly a swarm of kayaks and motorboats and rowboats that saved thousands of people. And he said, once we put that one rule out there, not one person was placed in a, in a, in a situation we couldn't bring them to safety. So think about how swarm leadership might apply to the work that you're doing so that you have robust, uh, productive leaders really invested in what they're doing and what you're accomplishing, especially as you're leading this field and leading the healthcare system into a new era. I will end where I began. If you have people in your case turning to one another, as we saw in the Boston Marathon bombing, as we saw in H1N1, with the simple question, how can I make you a success? Just imagine what you'd be able to accomplish. Thank you very much.